Good morning and welcome. My name is Kathy Pratt Legrell and I'm chair uh, of the board of the Jimmy Pratt Foundation. Uh, joining me here today are uh, the Honorable Margaret Minori McCain uh, with the Wallace and Margaret McCain Foundation, Mike Nurse, and Mike Nurse, Mike Claire with the Harris Center, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. David Philpott with the Faculty of Education, and also our research chair and member of our board. Good morning, all. Newfoundland and Labrador. That's why we're here. And to that end, I will tell you about three important events initiated by an alliance between the Jimmy Pratt Foundation, the Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Foundation, and the Harris Center at Memorial University. The Jimmy Pratt Foundation is a private family foundation which was established in 2010 to contribute towards projects and programs that support building a healthy, inclusive, and resilient society while helping youth at risk. In keeping with the Foundation's mission, we encourage the advancement of the health, education, and security of children from birth to 18 years of age and their families. Childhood resilience is our main focus. Our purpose is the advancement, collaboration, and dissemination of research to educate the community and to inform intervention. Our three organizations have developed a discussion paper, which you have before you, um, based on emerging research and existing models of care in Canada that will inform a public debate in our province on the importance of quality early child care and education. And we are formally releasing it here today. And later, we, are, uh, we have a meeting with the uh, Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, the Honorable Kathy Dunderdale, and we will be sharing it with her as well and inviting her to join our discussion. The paper, The Early Years Last a Lifetime, has been produced by our three organizations and is based on current research and expertise in our province and across the country. This paper will form the basis of a year-long series of events and discussions on improving early learning and care in our province. The second event happens tonight when the Harris Center hosts a special guest lecture by the Honorable Margaret Nori McCain, former Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick, who will speak on successful kids, successful country, why smart public policy needs to include early childhood education. This speech will take place at the D.F. Cook Recital Hall at MUN, and uh, it will be at 7.30 this evening, and there is free parking at Lot 15B, and a reception will follow. The third event starts tomorrow, November the 6th. The partnership is hosting a day-long visioning workshop to stimulate the beginning of a year-long public conversation on what quality early childhood education and care could look like in our province. This is uh, taking place at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow at the Johnson Geo Center. This workshop is intended to spark an informed public discussion about the value of a comprehensive, integrative, and inclusive early learning strategy for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Throughout the workshop, there will be keynote speeches from national specialists and, a pa and panel discussions with local stakeholders. There are still a few openings if you would like to attend this workshop. Also, this is a year-long, as a year-long initiative, uh, we have secured world-renowned speakers to present on some of the emerging issues. To date, our confirmed speakers are, in March of 2014, Dr. Ted Malouche, Professor of Human Development at Burbeck University of London. He is an internationally recognized expert in the study of child development and has extensive experience with longitudinal studies. In April of 2014, Mr. Craig Alexander, Chief Economist with TD Bank and a Senior Vice President, who is also an advocate of early uh, childhood education, will be speaking to us and we thank the uh, St. John's Board of Trade. Also at that time, at the same time, uh, Mr. Pierre Fortin, who is an economist in Quebec, uh, will be presenting, and he has done extensive studies on the economic benefits of uh, the funded daycare program in Quebec. 
Um, while I will welcome your questions in a few minutes, I first want to offer an opportunity for all members of this partnership to say a few words. As I said earlier, Margaret Norrie McCain, former Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick and head of the Wallace and Margaret McCain Foundation. Margaret. Thank you, Kathy. First of all, let me say, Kathy, how happy I am to be here. Michael, welcome. Um, I really appreciate the welcome that I've received. Uh, ever since Kathy and I met, I think it was three years ago, over a glass of wine, we found we had common ground in our value system and our past experiences. And uh, the partnership that we have developed, the collaborative efforts that we have developed over the past three years, has been meaningful to us at the Margaret and Walls McCain Foundation. Uh, and I think uh, out of that has grown a true friendship between Kathy and me. So thank you, Kathy, for uh, inviting us to be here today and for allowing us to be a partner with you on this very, very wonderful initiative uh, in Newfoundland. This is a fantastic piece of work. We're very happy to have had a part in this. Happy to get to know the Harris Center because I realize now, uh, we have learned to realize that uh, you are a very important part of the fabric of Newfoundland and, and what happens in Newfoundland through uh, your the information and the expertise that you bring to developing public policy. So uh, we are excited about the partnerships that have developed as a result of this initiative on early learning. So I look forward to today and uh, I commend you for the initiatives that you have planned for the coming year. Uh, Kathy has already stated the um, mission and vision of the initiative and of the Pratt Foundation and the Harris Center. And we're happy to come in and, and uh, be there with you. I just will add a few points, uh, comments about why early learning is so important. There are three major socioeconomic upheavals within our country and our society that confront policymakers today. The changing job market, a highly mobile workforce, and a modern family, which is in need of two uh, earners. I will be speaking tonight uh, in, um, more completely about these changes in society. Another point that's important to remember is that children today, little children today, are the first generation who are spending a large part of their early childhood away from and outside the family home. It's very different from the from the situation that I knew as a young mother. But at the same time as this is happening, neuroscientific research is demonstrating that environments, the environment of this child, in the earliest years of the child's life are critical for every aspect of a child's development. And happily across Canada, political parties, whether they're liberal, NDP, or conservative, and we're talking to all stripes, are beginning to recognize this and are responding. And they recognize two realities. Women are refusing to fill the labor force and the bassinet. Women are also, or society is also in need of a knowledgeable, nimble workforce, and that includes women. So women are in the workforce to stay, and these are realities that our governments are recognizing. They also recognize now more and more our children need to be well cared for, they need to be stimulated, they need to be nurtured. And this is where education comes in and where it reigns. Early education helps children learn how to learn. They're not, we're not talking about schoolifying children. We're talking about uh, developing children so that they learn how to learn. Knowing how to learn is the new uh, essential in a knowledge-based economy. And if it's done well, early education prepares children for this new reality. It is fair. It's equitable, it works, it is affordable, and we have very many good Made in Canada examples of how to proceed. This discussion paper, which is extremely well done, extremely important, being released today, is a Made in Newfoundland guide, and every province has to do it their way, tailored to their own personal uh, individual needs. This discussion paper outlines the problems, garners the evidence, 
and it makes practical suggestions. And so we welcome again uh, this opportunity, Kathy, to partner with you and with the Harris Center mm -hmm. to support directions which are guided by the best possible evidence available to us today in society. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, and thank you for your, your friendship and our partnership <laughs> together. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like now to invite uh, Michael Clare to speak uh, on behalf of the Harris Centre. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you very much, Margaret. I echo both of your statements uh, about the need for this program. So we're coming a bit late to this partnership. We're the last uh, group to join. And on behalf of the Harris Centre of Memorial University, I just want to say how pleased and, and delighted we are to be able to, to have been invited to join this partnership. Um, this is going to be a year-long initiative. We hope to bring our expertise in public policy in, in academia to bear on the topic. Our role is to inform the public of Newfoundland and Labrador about the benefits of early childhood education, and we will apply all of our skills to doing that. We want people of the province to pay attention, and therefore we will be using the media to help us get our message across. And hopefully at the end of the year we will have taken a really good look at all of the factors here in this province and be able to possibly offer recommendations to governments at whatever level so that we can look at implementing a program like this in this province. So again, thank you very much for inviting us to be a part of it. This is a very important project for the Harris Centre and uh, I look forward to working together next year on this. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and thank you too for your partnership and and, and I now uh, finally will ask Dr. David Philpott uh, to bring a broader context to this paper. David? Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Today is part of a much bigger picture. At the heart of the Jimmy Pratt Foundation's mission is promoting resiliency in children and their families. We recognize that the early years last a lifetime that the first five years of a child's life are the most critical time of growth and learning. In fact, 85% of the brain is developed by the time a child finishes kindergarten. Research is showing that public investment in effective early learning programs produce benefits to children, to families, to communities, and to society that far outweigh the costs. Today, economies are changing, communities are changing, and families are changing. Today's family is smaller. Both parents need to work to, both, to meet both the needs of their family and their community. Parents need choices for ensuring accessible quality care for their children that reflect the wealth of knowledge and research which exists globally. Early learning is good for children, it's good for families, and it's good for communities. Acting now secures everyone's future. We have been involved in promoting this discussion for some time now. In 2009, we uh, joined the Funders Working Group, a collection of seven philanthropic foundations from across Canada who pool their resources to both inform research and drive public policy on quality early learning in Canada. In 2011, we were part of the development and release of Early Years 3, a national report on the research, the, the, the economics, and the benefits of early child education, as well as where each province stands in the delivery of care. We, with the Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Foundation, have already pledged $300,000 in research on early learning education here in Newfoundland, and our website documents those projects, as well as other initiatives that have helped bring us to this day. This paper has been informed by a number of events which we have had over the last number of years, ranging from focus groups in 2011 to a symposium at the Geo Center in 2012, and to another focus group this past September. We want to be explicit in our goal, to begin a discussion on how this province can strengthen models of early education for young children that are informed by the wealth of knowledge which already exists. We want our children to have high quality, accessible and inclusive, healthy spaces and places that are exemplary in their care. Thank you, David. I conclude by saying that I'm very proud to be working on this initiative and very happy to be working with these partners. This is just the beginning. We hope these events in the next two days will stimulate dialogue to get people talking about how we can make things better for preschool children both in Newfoundland and Labrador and in Canada as a whole. So we're open for questions.
you said you were meeting the trainer. When is that today, or is that soon, or on schedule, or? Uh, it is today, and we have an appointment. Okay. And uh, also, um, uh, the paper talks about uh, you know the ideal child, you know what what an ideal program would look like, and obviously everyone knows it's not an ideal world. There's a lot of information in the paper here about uh, the value um, and the you know. Uh, the reasons to invest for the future and all that stuff. We all know politicians live in these four-year election bubbles. So uh, will this discussion also include costs? And will that weigh, or how much, I guess, will finances weigh in your eventual paper at the end of the year? Well, I think I'd first like to say that uh, what we're hoping to present government or anyone who cares to listen is a roadmap as to how to get there. In terms of the economics of doing, of, of engaging in, in, and beginning this process of, of providing universal accept, uh, accessible early learning and care for children, uh, we only have to look at other provinces who have undertaken this. And if we look at Quebec, for example, not that that's an ideal model for Newfoundland because we want to make a Newfoundland model, but uh, in their subsidized uh, uh, daycare at $7 a day, they've been able to demonstrate that they, it's a net profit to their province through uh, federal taxes, more people in the workforce, just more money going around. And I think that uh, the research is there to show that the economics of this work um, Craig Alexander, who's coming here in April, is a passionate advocate, and he's an economist with a bank. Um, so he's somebody who strongly believes in this, and Pierre Fortin. And, um, but the other thing is, it's what's right for children. And, uh, and in our changing workforce, and in our changing work environment here in Newfoundland and Labrador, where we have a, sh a shortage of skilled workers, we want to be able to, to attract people. And this just doesn't apply to women in the workforce. Uh, to bring families here, uh, if the man is the breadwinner and he's the one who's working, he's looking for options for his family as well. And I don't know if anyone else at the table has anything to offer. Well, I, I think it's important to add that the paper is based in the research on the benefits of early learning and care, but it's also based on the research on the economics of early learning and care. And there's countless, endless examples of how this is affordable, as well as the cost of not acting on this. Uh, so the paper encourages a conversation for Newfoundlanders in 2013 in the reality of our economy right now and the economic opportunities we have and the social challenges that come out of those economic uh, uh, benefits. So I guess the questions we're asking are, if not now, then when? If we can't have this conversation now when we're facing the economic benefits of, of a very healthy economy, when can we have it? And I wish that the rest of Canada had as strong an economic picture mm -hmm. as Newfoundland has. We're talking to provinces that are really burdened with humongous, frightening mm -hmm. debt. But they have made a commitment to this because they recognize that down the road this is contributing to a much more productive, contributing uh, workforce and healthy population. And if we go back to Quebec, uh, just to reiterate what David and Kathy have said, the, science, the research that came out on their system, which is 20 years old, 20 years in existence, and it, and it, it isn't, wasn't even perfect at that, but it paid for itself. For every dollar invested, they got a dollar five back, and in addition, put 44 cents into federal coffers without any investment by the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did that happen? Well, it, it uh, put women in the workforce, where they, they, and they needed the, the, the workers, uh, and because of that, they got tax revenues. But there was also a big, um, a le much less drawdown on social services. Another thing it did, it it cut 50, uh, child poverty by 50 percent. So there, the economic benefits. It, it's it, it's a twofold story. It's uh, uh, it's a human development story, but it's also an eco economic development and stimulation story. And if I could add my two cents. Um, uh, I'll gently chide you on the, the four-year cycle of politicians. I think we do have politicians who are visionary and look to the long term. And the benefits, the economic benefits we've been talking about now are relatively short term. You put a public dollar into something, you get a public dollar back, dollar five in taxes, et cetera. 
but there's also much long-term benefits. So you have down the road lower costs in social welfare, criminal justice, um, you know, remedial education, etc. You know, m much longer, 10, 12, 15 years down the road. So I think these have been demonstrated, and we will try to enter these economic factors into the discussion as well. You're it, dear. <laughs> Is that okay for you? I have a question for you, Kathy. Yes. Uh, one question for both Kathy and Margaret. Why do you do this? Well, uh, I'll let Margaret answer that question first, and I'll follow. <laughs> I've never really had a good answer. <laughs> um, I am committed to it, and I'll probably it'll it'll probably do me in. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, as I did a, a, a radio TV program for CBC at 7 a.m. I said to the interviewer, if you think I'm not dedicated to this, what 79-year-old woman is going to get up when it's still pitch dark and go, do her hair and makeup to talk about early education intelligently at 7 a.m.? Are you kidding? <laughs> it, it's in my, now it's uh, part of my heart, my being. Uh, I care about Canada. I care about our provinces. And I've had the pleasure of living in quite a few of them. <laughs> Um, I guess that must be it. Kathy, what do you do? Um, I guess it started uh, when I was a working mother looking for daycare spaces for my children and um, having tremendous difficulty with that and that was over 30 years ago. The situation certainly hasn't improved since then. Um, during that time I also became involved in education and I was fortunate enough as a school trustee to advance becoming president of the Canadian School Boards Association and through that uh, through that experience I found out a lot about children who were going to school who weren't ready to go to school who for various reasons socioeconomic um, just where they lived uh, single parent situations there could be a myriad of reasons why but these children started a school at a place that was less than their peers through no fault of their own. And they experience those disadvantages all the way through school. Their um, learning issues were not identified until much later. Uh, they, they just didn't have the support that they needed. And that handicap follows them for the rest of their lives. And that just instilled such a passion in me to think that our society in this day and age is allowing this injustice to happen. I know that's a strong word, but that's how I feel. That young children, through no fault of their own, are being marginalized by not having adequate access to good early learning and care. Um, and then the other reason uh, is that I grew up with a mentally and physically handicapped brother, who is the namesake of our foundation. And he was fortunate enough to have the, the advantages and the supports that allowed him, uh, while, albeit he was uh, handicapped, uh, worked in sheltered employment for 25 years of his life. If he had not had the support that our family gave him, that would not have been possible. And so I know what's possible. I know what we can do. And I know that with further, uh, especially in working with Margaret and the other foundations, I've discovered that this is not expensive. This it has a net return to anybody who invests in it. So why wouldn't we do this? And why aren't we doing it now? Kathy has the right answers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much.